Good evening. As promised, William F. DeVault, Romantic Poet of the Internet and U.S. National Beat Poet Laureate Emeritus. I'm here on Saturday night, the 6th of June, 2020. Uh, it's been a weird week. Um, coronavirus is still doing its thing. And the protests concerning um, the George Floyd and related um, killings uh, rage around us. I live near Washington, D.C. at this time and uh, see a lot of it in the local news. Um, I understand the upset. I understand the concern and I understand the changes that need to be made. But I'm not here tonight to talk politics. What I am here tonight to do is read from my book, Ronan in the Temple of Aphrodite. Actually, I'm here to read the book, Ronan in the Temple of Aphrodite. The book itself has a, a strange little quirk to its history, uh, not the least of which is being that there are two different covers to it. I initially did a cover with one model. It was a nice cover, and I liked it. And after it came out, she started wanting to make changes. And after a while, her demands became a little extreme, so I dropped her, and I turned the cover over to my, my dear friend, Alice Oprescu, who is a model um, from Romania, and she did a very nice cover. So I, I appreciate that immensely. The book, uh, the title, Ronan in the Temple of Aphrodite, reflects on the fact that sometimes you are not tied in a relationship, but you're still a romantic. Uh, a Ronan is a masterless samurai, and the Temple of Aphrodite refers to believing in love. Uh, the first poem is Glass Samurai, which I know is a particular favorite of my son Elric's. I always thought that I would die like some deranged glass samurai charging into battle, ill-prepared. But destiny, it laughs and smiles and makes the inches into miles and we cannot choose who is spared. The coin is tossed, the battle lost, and we just watch to Pentecost, for we are not deific in our wrath. I will recall with love and hope what lays beyond the coiled rope, and try to face the tragic with a laugh. I always knew that I would die like some deranged glass samurai, spinning legends on a blade of light. But memory, it has its way with those who thought they'd stop and play and get back home before the falling light. The tapestry unravels slow, but in the end the patterns go it's to wind upon the spools from which they came. What nature in the end denies, and we are left to eulogize, that we can leave behind more than a name. I always prayed that I could die like some deranged glass samurai, holding back the hordes for lover's flight. So we shall see, when falls the run, if I could end what I'd begun, or played a pawn to rook or queen or knight. If you've been to any of my readings, you've encountered this poem before, Love is an Howling Beast. Uh, it was about the emotional aftermath of my second divorce. Love is an howling beast, consumed by rage that cannot hate. Fate, sealing wax and clay and stone, or bone and blood and flesh. Yes, flesh, meshing in memory, memory bo memory is born of hope or to grope in darkness, when what you need bleeds out in the gutters as silence utters a grave pronouncement. A riot act, a solemn pact stacked atop distant mountains, too far to see more than featureless white. I would peel back my own flesh with raw fingertips to know again the texture of her lips, the scent of her hips, and do not have as mocking memory the trips to the well of her heart, I am that grotesque statue left in silent field for future generations to wonder on the purpose of. I am. I can't pretend to be some legend of old, bold and taken with a dream, walking an infinite road for country or queen. I am just a man, perhaps amplified by my love for you, purified of many doubts, clarified to shout your name above all in time. 
in time. In time with the music of my blood that you awoke as I stood on the edge of the infinite cliffs and dared fate to push you, speak of courage. I speak of purpose. For beyond the black and the crimson and the gold, I am my own panther, and I will wait for worthy prey, even until the sun sets beyond the ocean of tranquility. I always like this next poem, Cartouche. Cartouche, my fingers melt the surface of the stone. I alone know the meaning of the symbols I leave. Names unpronounceable, truths unrenounceable. Enigma for the stoic sleuths that will ponder the meaning of words without words, sounds without sounds, dreams without end, cut into the living stone to bear witness of a time when gods walked the earth and spoke only to be heard. Here's a short one for you, Ashes and Ought. How hard it grows a heart in silence, the violence of isolation, the absolute zero of self-immolation, and soon there is nothing but ashes, ashes and ought, and not for seeking fingertips to hold on to. Another fairly popular one of mine is Braji de Freya on his deathbed, and I'm always having to explain this, so let me go ahead and explain it first. Braji was the Norse god of poetry and eloquence. He was married to Edom, but this does not say Edom, it says Freya. Freya was the goddess of youth, well not youth, of beauty and grace and female warriors. And for this poem, I created a image of Braji, old and dying, and rather than sending his wife Eden, I-D-U-N, who served the golden apples that made the gods immortal, they sent in Freya to remind him of his passions. I am not blind to the beauty, but like a paralyzed man, his bed a prison, unable to touch or taste or smell, only those things brought to him or that, by accident, slipped through the walls of glass and steel and watchful eyes that institutionalize lies to their own ends. The, steler, the sterility befriends those whose clothes tell a tale of wanderlust. In worn souls and frayed hems and dust, dust of a thousand roads, some walk to the horizon, some merely tested with timid toes like an unfamiliar water pool at dawn, yawning a frigid maw to pull you in and cramp body and soul. I am not blind to the beauty, but bound to it. The sound of it is like music to a deaf man who can perceive the bass line as it shakes the snakes from the foundations of the world, made of a necessity, a necessary doubt of things spoken with too much conviction. Words used as truncheons to beat down relevant inconveniencies. The luxury of truth is something few afford in the discordant umbilical left to hang, to dangle. At an angle on the edge of cliffs we once leapt from, unafraid of the consequences of gravity and the pursuit of knowledge, I can see it, eyes open or closed, limbs and lips languid or posed like posturing candidates for a title. I am not sure I would or should award again. I am not blind to the beauty. I'm not deaf to the, to the music. I'm not cold to your touch. I am not tongue numb to your taste. I am not unaware of your perfume as you enter the room and leave a telltale marker to be followed into Elysium. If I am willing to rise from my chosen catalepsy and wear again the patchwork pelts and the mark of my station and office, to follow where I swore I would go when the word was given in silent mouthing from across the room, but in plain sight, for I am not blind to the beauty as I plant my fists in the stones and press upward with aching muscles to fulfill that which is ordained of me. Let's keep it simple, people. A very simple sonnet called Waiting for the Pentecost. There is nothing sadder than the persistent scent of your attar, the sheets 
no longer so warm and pampered by your frame, sorrowed but not as downcast as I am, clutching aromed memories to a scar where once was a heart, fiercely pierced and glad to bleed unborrowed emotions, potions imbibed in subtle sips not just to sample, but to prove the, le the leisure of the treasured pleasure to be measured in infinities, a resurrection perhaps, pardon me, <laughs> to be prophesied in your eyes, to move me to the transfigured instant of passion and purpose, or to disease a soul already spread thin on wings of wax and stolen feathers. As I am frail, so is the sun an inconstant lover. Comfort in winter and the furnace of the crucible of doubt in summer's span, never more than less than welcomed according to the need of the lover. And I have trusted skies too deeply to not regard the rose's kiss a true friend before evidence of thorns is regarded in accepting the legacy of you. Will alone. We recognize it in oaths we made to ourselves and before God, claiming we'll defeat the greater powers of hate or fear or ignorance or passivity, filling our cavities with the oil of cloves we pressed for this eventuality. The tempering fire it roars with scores of coals of souls we plucked from the grounding earth, part of the birth of a newly, truly ordered world, a place where hurled epithets splinter on the bending curve of our hope. Will alone is regent, reagent, gentle in the manner of rain, which before the wind blasts the rocks until they fall, in time to be washed to the bottom of the seas. As we please, we do. As we do, we are undone, as the sun cannot penetrate the oceans. Philosophically, you may be familiar with Pascal's wager. Blaise Pascal presented the notion that um, if there is a God, and if that God defines the fate of your immortal soul, then to give up a small portion of your life, not even your whole life, but to dedicate a small portion of your life to behaving in a manner as God would have you behave, that is to say, moral, moral and decent and charitable and all that, then you're wagering a finite thing for an infinite reward. Uh, I, it's not something I generally cling to philosophically because I think that uh, doing the right thing for a reward is not morality, it is barter. But um, the title of this poem is Rascal's Wager. Time heals. No, it seals. Memory in a shelf of self-validation until we no longer recall the truth, until we no longer care what is reality and what is merely our self-esteem currency. No doubt we tear out only the images we want to carry with us in the Velcro billfold of memory so that we never have to accept as dealt the cards that fell to the stained and faded felt. This next poem is called That's Going to Leave a Mark. Um, it was about a very short and intense affair I was involved in. That's going to leave a mark, the stark raving sad of a parting of lovers when the covers are blown and the seeds sown on toxic soil are wasted like lovebirds basted in a twisted, fisted memory that never really happened, the way it could have, should have. But the scar remains, nonetheless. Brave and Constant Hearts Where I have found constant and brave hearts willing to believe in things greater than the mediocrities, the hypocrisies we face and trace and place front and center, as we seek to enter a heaven of our own design? I am yet unconvinced of the futility of love, but the utility of a brave and constant heart seems lost on the failed experiments, incapable of transcending the descending days into self-mutilation. The singer sings of hearts of gold, and I am sold on the value of such a dream, but not as paperweight to hold down our bills of wrath and hate and grief, 
replacing belief with relief that we are yet undiscovered. Buried deep we sleep and never wake, the faded snake in a mythology of temptation to be blamed by the lamed when they cannot admit their history, their complicity in all that this has turned from gold to green to brown to black. I keep glancing up and seeing the number of people in and out of the room changing. It gives me a running total in the cycle. Go up, go down, go up, go down. Um, but I'll keep going, even if there's nobody in the room, because I made a promise. Uh, this one is called Phoenix and Gollum. Uh, for those of you who do not know what a Gollum is, uh, a Gollum in um, the Kabbalah is a figure made of clay uh, with a life essence breathed into it that uh, was created by a rabbinical scholar with knowledge of uh, the Kabbalah magics. It basically means a soulless entity. Phoenix and Gollum, handmade and man-made, fire and clay, the blaze of, the haze of, self-immolation, an act of self-preservation, brass feathers, quickened in the flesh of clay and phosphorus, a porous purpose to usurp us when we finally get traction on the scrith of life. Awake, my creation. Awake and open wide the iron jowls to howls of Eden and Armageddon. Awake, pass through the sands like water on the beach, reaching for the leeching pull of buried rivers of thought not yet assembled in coherence, but ready for the kiln of fire at temperatures where clay melts and mythologies turn to ash. Awake to seize the fates of enclawed hands, iron bands that will cling against the sting of all the scorpions of resistance. Persistence being a virtue of the damned. The lighting in this room is just a little bit off for me. So if I'm having a little trouble with the book, yes, I know I should memorize all my poems, but I have a catalog of over 30,000 um, and to be able to memorize any one poem would be roughly the equivalent of a, of a very prolific novelist, um, be, like Tom Clancy being told, oh yeah, the uh, 17th paragraph in chapter 4 of your third book. Duh. Of course, who knows? He may have been able to do that. I don't know. Prisoner of the Mountain. Um, this is a romanticized extension of an issue I ran into a few years ago where once people found out I was a poet and a poet of note, um, they generally sought the side door. And I'm talking about women. Uh, some of them come to me looking to be ma made immortal and some of them don't want the pressure of being made immortal. It is lonely up on Olympus this time of year. The skies are gray, but a mystical crystal clear and I can see Valhalla just o'er to the east hear the echoes in the valleys of some Asgardian feast. Bast is passed into the west to fill her barren bed. Valkyries and mythic beasts have played their part, then fled. The water run in rivers known for stealing mortal thought to spill across the splintered stones that rose aloft for naught. The marble cold beneath this, his feet, the throne fits none too well. An aging back that could attack the legions all of hell but carries now not sword nor shield nor banner to parade to mark the line where love divine unleashed a serenade. In golden hearts, in fits and starts, the man recalls it all and wonders how he found himself entombed within this hall. Immortal prayers and well-worn stairs ascend to silent cell, a tower of bleached ivory to wear as hermit's shell. The frescoes do not listen to him when he weeps and roars, Chosen guardians, they are unmoved by mercy, he implores, to strike him down or split the walls that he may slip away, and promise ne'er to err again, dare come this way. But ancient walls have stood too long, and well they keep their place, to serve a stock of timeless clock in ringing his disgrace. He binds his hands in iron bands and strikes against the stone, to one day reach the shadowed breach, and for his sins... A tongue. Here's a short one. The Great Grey Tomorrow. 
Each day the hollow grows larger and more profound. I can hear the echoes, the echoes, the echoes, fading into a distance still inside of me, offset by time, and yet I cannot determine whether they are fading into the past or a harbinger of a great gray tomorrow. Shadowbox Dragons I used to wait by the gate, reliant on my own distant energy and patient for the epiphanies that not everyone is dealt to the felt of the casino of life. And eventually, eventually, I lose faith in my projected shadows as the gray lights barely touch me anymore, sore from a thousand aging scars earned in burned fingertips. But resolutions bring revolutions if you are sincere and fear nothing but the stagnancy of memories made in the sheltered corners of recollection in a boneyard where I once stood guard. I'm tired of waiting, wanting for things that maybe never were to begin with, and now are shadow box dragons to be feared only by the ignorant who believe their own mythologies. Like a disease only dreamt when you wake up, whole and in control of what was or could have been, or should have been, a question quested and tested, and eventually bested by the better judgments. So I place my hands on the gates and press outward, feeling the hinges groan, as they do what they were built to do, as I have done, and now it is time for new adventures away from the stench of the boneyard of memory. Oh. The Searching for a Dream The shells are clear that guard the sphere where I would take my quest, that they may taunt and my dreams haunt, denying me my rest. But they do not crack but hurl me back, when I seek out the scene, and so they mock with clever lock the searching for a dream. The Resolve of an Earnest Lover Adrift I know hearts have their time and they soon pass their prime like a vicar's oak plate just begging for an offering. The coins we shall spend, we can't always defend, but if we hesitate, it is for naught we are hoarding. To the angels who bent to the words I have sent, I am both grateful and honored by your hours. For the sands will still flow, and this I well know, from memories both hateful and those that have blossomed bright flowers. If this path shall be madness, I shall walk it with gladness, accepting the cold and the rain, as a challenge to my desires. And should the night prove dark, and the nightingale a lark, I will wear proudly the stain of an earnest lover's fires. Certainly, if you've been listening to my stuff for any length of time, or reading my stuff for any length of time, you run into the capitalized tea palms. Uh, Testament, Triumph, there's a couple others. This is probably the shortest one of the bunch. It's called Titan. Water to earth, earth to air, air to fire, to be quenched by the waves. Nobody saves anybody in the end, my friend. It all ends badly, sadly, for the brave soldiers on the barricades playing charades of national anthems and a battle cry that will die soon after the sound. Pounding the earth of pounding the walls of stone and earth with fists made bloody, by the ruddy soil boiling away the clay to leave us something primal, criminal, and best forgotten, a test gone rotten and the eggs float like a capsized boat, unable to carry anything but an object lesson. This next poem, I'm going to explain it slightly. It's called Shadows in the Shade. I had a lover who um, treated me badly for a period of several years, off and on, off and on. And I'm not saying she's a bad person, but I told her if she needed to quit with the off and on behavior. She needed to pick a path and take it. Or I said one day, 
when your totem muse is used, it will be as an epithet, not as a praise. A sobriquet turns epithet. The prophecy is made. The diamond turns to withered coals, the emerald dress to jade. A lover's kiss has gone amiss. The warmth too soon will fade. And I am left to contemplate the shadows in the shade. The tapestry binds until the last cut unravels the patterns we'd bound. Hidden in weavings and testified leavings, the needle once fabled is found. And thus the riddle rides the hides of beasts of legends and myth, cutting with blades of lost serenades the soul from the troubadour's pith. A sobriquet turns epithet, the prophecy is made, the diamonds turn to withered coals, the emerald dress to jade. A lover's kiss has gone amiss, the warmth too soon shall fade, and I am left to contemplate the shadows in the shade. You have got to be tired of this poem that's coming up next. Uh, it was used as the vocals to Ophidian's uh, Pegasus, and it's been on several of my readings, but I like it, and uh, it's in this book. I promised I'd read this book. The Philosophy of Dreams. Touch me, for I am flesh as you, given to the same needs for air and food and warmth, communicated between two bodies at rest, touching in all aspects possible and many improbable, as I pull a cat out of a quantum corner and make it into roses to bloom in arcs of every color of a spectrum of another sphere, as they fill the room with exotic perfumes I brought back with me on a trip to the stars. Sing for me, I will smile and touch your hair and dare to sing along when I know the words, for we are at best in blended voice and thought and flesh. Yes, I recall mere moments ago when I could not tell the terminus between your light and my darkness, as angels averted their eyes and we made the case for unity between us. It was. Yes, it was. It was something I will write of when I catch my breath and I can find words unique and perfect and passionate enough. Dream of me, for I dream of you. I dreamt of you even before I heard your voice, before I knew your name, when all I knew was that, by the same evidence that I know that there is a God, you exist and existed. And I would find you even if I had to climb mountains of madness and sail, sail forever it seemed, on seas of the mediocrity of life. For there is too much to be lost to the world if I was right. If love is and was and will be regent, regret wets sweated sins, but I am a penitent pilgrim, lost on the road to Golgotha, seeking something more than the philosophy of dreams. If you heard my reading of... Um, Love Gods of Forgotten Religion, I spoke about the faceted sphere poems. This is not actually a member of that group, but it references it. It's called The Sphere is Faceted. Where we love is a different place. For there is a surface to the sky that bends the light a color I have not seen anywhere else. And we lay like children in the sun, counting clouds that shift shapes shamelessly for our amusement, as we do for theirs. And you are fair, fairer than any of the women I never met in this world, and yet in our places other times, other intersections of light and life, it is they I caress late at night to awaken for passions that never fade and that make for splendid words on pages you cherish all the days of your life. Your lips are soft and full, and taste of opportunities I did not lose this time and place. Your arms are mine, and I surrender all my dreams to your embrace, facing you when you merge into the essence of our affections and our hungers. And I seek your soul in corners you gave me to explore with grace and gratitude for the ravenous gentility of my quests. 
And in this sphere, this here and now, you will have me in your dreams, when you least expect my appearance, wedged between memory and fantasy, sold into your faceted sphere, for a few words you cannot precisely recall, but are glad for, as am I. How about a little wistfulness? <laughs> she dances away when I awake. She breathes in moist and mystic murmurs that steal my memory of oaths I've made on other altars, to other deities, my offerings taken to the core of a softer decorum. And bright eyes of a goddess, the lips of a prophet, the smooth skin of a feral beast emerging into legends in soft sin and silk. She touches me with hands and eyes and words and sounds that cut still deeper, deeper than my, than any probe I send into her sphere, seeking answers to the ancient riddles. The smile of one who knows, the form of one who glows, the scent of one who chose to be here with me tonight. And she dances away when I awake, for, he, for she is not, if ever, in my arms, but she is in my heart. And in prophesied memory she dwells immortal. Haunted. I am haunted, taunted by the memory's locked thoughts caught in the instant we touched, the scent of your skin, the thin fabrics falling, calling me to carry you, which I did, in duty and joy. I would not erase from memory, for shame or blame, or name of all the actors who pose in rows of rose-tinted artifices, seeking to speak what we said, sell what we wove, capture even a fragment of a morsel, of a shadow, of a specter, of the passion and the honest purpose I know I brought to lay before you, as an offering of love, and to bind me forever to the every sensory sinew of the cords of words I spoke and the offerings I made in flesh and time, where and when I am still haunted by you now. I like this poem. Sisyphus and Prometheus. For those of you who haven't been keeping up on your mythology, which is a shame if you're listening to my poetry, uh, Sisyphus was a gentleman who um, pissed off the gods and was given a job to roll a boulder up a hill. The trick was, as the boulder went further up the hill, it would get heavier and heavier and heavier, until eventually he couldn't push it anymore, and it would roll back down the hill, and he'd have to start again. Prometheus was the god who gave man fire, and for that noble action, um, he was chained up, and a vulture was set to picking out his liver every day. Uh, he was immortal, so he couldn't die, but he could certainly feel pain. This is not a love poem, for love does not lay upon me like sweat and air and the sour taste of rain. It is a moment, captured like a firefly and left in the jar too long to survive. But it is an honest thought, and it retains at least the shape and substance from whence it came. Pain, self-pity, loathing, a world weariness like poison driven in with careless needles to steal what little remains. There are poems that I acknowledge are decent, that I, they just never really hang with me once I write them. This is one of those, but recently I found somebody online had taken a reading, of, uh, a reading I'd done of it and uh, put together a video for it, and it's available out on uh, YouTube. It's called The Jester of Hearts. Now, for those of you who do not know what an amomancer is, I like playing with words, and years ago I coined the word emote. A-M-O-T-E. If you put a slash between the O and the T, you have a mote, which is Latin for I love you. To amote is to speak of love. An amomancy is a writing on the subject of love. And an amomancer is someone who writes amomancies. It all evolved over a period of about 10 years. The Jester of Hearts. The amomancer bears his soul for the pleasure of the crowd. 
He weaves each word so it is heard as whispered, and yet loud. The princesses, they squeal and clap and sigh upon his heart, and yet he is a stone, alone, and left upon his part. For there is no true paramour for him to feel their heat, and fires, pyres, and bright desires come to ashes and defeat. The jester for the hungry thoughts that stir and entertain, the amomancer sits alone and weeps from every vein. And yet this ancient summoner of blood and sweat and pain can never step from in the light and seek a settling stain. Lightning flashes cross the sky and yet cannot be caught, and so it is with what he found in places long forgot. A fallen clown can make us laugh just tugging on a rope, but he who brings to us our hearts is barren, without hope. His soul it catches radiance and bends it back like light, but the other side of that mirror is an unenviable night. The amomancer bears his soul for the pleasure of the crowd. He weaves each word as it is heard, as whispered and yet loud. The princesses, they squeal and clap and sigh upon his heart, and yet he is as stone, alone, and left upon his part. This next poem is called Deep and Hungry Pockets, and it actually was inspired by something a friend of mine said concerning the need um, for them to have deeper pockets and that those pockets would be hungry. They needed to be able to store more emotion and hope. I am lost, lost to the night, lost to the light, to the night. While on white is my banner of war, boring plain song to a toneless drumming, humming like an indifferent hive of stingless bees high in the trees above the patient earth, worth little when the honey runs dry. And I need to pull the knife out of my back and get a life where my knack for giving more than I get is welcomed with more than deep and hungry pockets. All used up and the cup is less than half full now, a vow of unbent knees so close to being broken. Unspoken is the sixth word, but it was heard before when the floor was wood and life was good and love was not an obscenity an amenity to be bartered off, to be placed in deep and hungry pockets. In the Shadows of an Ancient City. One second while I adjust. Oh, that actually makes the light better. Pull back the flesh from o'er my bones and throw them to the fire. I need them not when mortal thought is vanquished by desire. And I am cast in shadows deep, to sleep amidst the gloaming walls made cold, laid bold and of a grade sold for the barter beetles, for victuals, or victuals actually. A spade, a trowel, thrown in the towel, and mortar up on the wall halls, where wings once beat the winds, to find the sky and found naught but a place to die. Flesh fails. There comes a time when flesh fails and will alone is not enough to stand second to the encroaching dust, the crust cracked. At the base of the Morongo Valley I will stand until the howling sands find nothing left to wear away and memory fades. Words are just words. Dreams are but imaginings and false prophets are to be stoned even if by grains of sand in the wind. Uh, for those of you who do not know what the Morongo Valley is, it's a valley in California at the edge of the high desert. The winds come howling through there every day. One of the largest wind, fact, uh, wind generation farms in the country are down there. And the wind is hot and warm and strong, and it comes pretty much year-round. And I love it. <laughs> The name of this poem is Elysium's Illusions. It has nothing to do with uh, Anastasia's Asylum. For some reason or other, people keep thinking that. Anastasia's Asylum was a little coffee house I used to go to in Los Angeles that, until I drank them completely out of jasmine tea, and then uh, I quit going there. 
because they couldn't seem to get any more back in. There is no wine so bitter as that of loving in futility. A mirror that does not reflect, a wall that does not protect a given heart from the folly of ill-considered sacrifice. So let it be with Caesar. The vague smile of faded solemnity, the wings of Icarus melted and molted, abject objects in the Museum of Muses, unamused by the poet's artifice. The oil slick on the Avalon Sea grows darker and thicker, so that the setting sun is reflected in colors courting crimson. To smile when the bile rises regent in the throat and veins is a trick for the faqui and his bowls inverted quicker to beg the blessings than to build on solid ground when sun and sky alike strike sullen with the hypocrisy of love and pain. I promise this gets more positive as we go along. <laughs> Didn't realize how much the middle portion of this book was really dark. Oh, we're still going there, pondering the darkness. We soar no more to shade the sunlight, burning our sweet yearning hearts. Parts yet played by those afraid to be what they once were. The darkness creeps while memory sleeps, and we are hollowed by the night. The hallowed fight takes flight, and we are left to ponder the darkness. Wandering, wondering, the ignorant thundering words that in time will seem wicked, veils we choose to wear as clothes, remain, remind, and blind us to the light, and we are sabotaged, the kicked. Prepare for what is past to cast a shadow on the shapeless walls, our prejudice and pretense calls and falls, bleeding in the pain we express, caressing all with hands of chance, a stumbling dance that left us grumbling in the memories made but unafraid we are. No time to ponder darkness. Volition My work is not yet done, and I must labor on, till silence overtakes me, and this life forsakes me. Every man sometimes fails, every martyr feels nails, but we fight through the gloaming with the night overcoming. My work is not yet done, so I must labor on, till silence overtakes me, and this life forsakes me. God sometimes seems silent in a world so violent, yet we charge or crawl or call to the winds and to the wall. My work is not yet done, so I must labor on, till silence overtakes me, and this life forsakes me. I am weary at times, I reflect on my crimes, taking motive where the night settles in over the fight. My work is not yet done, so I must labor on, till silence overtakes me, and this life forsakes me. This next poem, I got an amazing amount of email response to when I first published it, which was gratifying, but at the same time a little depressing. It's called, I Will Sleep Alone. I will sleep tonight and dream dreams I cannot express until new words are forged in the heart of the world. Words bright and black and so fresh and hot they burn the skin of the hands that hold them, but are as soothing as lemon ice on a parched tongue. And I will sleep alone, not by choice but by design, as the sailor on a sea of memory seeks new horizons, but for all his skill and talent, must make do with the wind that comes. Short poem. Infidelity. The flowers on the shelf have paled, their withered stems to speak the thought that patience is a virtue failed, when laid at odds with what is not. Evolving indifference. I think we've all had that situation where we're crazy mad in love with someone and they're crazy mad indifferent to the fact that you were born. Fun. I had a bad case of you, that's for sure. There was no cure. So I had to ride it out until the final card turned and I got burned, beyond all recognition. But my premonition played true and you took the money and ran, leaving me to understand there's a world of difference between the pathways of love and the persistence of a memory. You don't want me to let go of, because there's more to be had. 
drained from veins already black with the disease of caring. Alas, the flowers wilted. When you were lost, I found you. When did the dark surround you, and shared my light as long as you did ask? Not for your love or glory, but to love with nothing for me. I held at bay the night as purposed task. Of Fallen and Falling Angels The shattered glass leaves fractured face as witness to this cracked sphere. We place our bets on cold disgrace and shed the patronizing tear. So we are pierced or cut or bent to make a sport for others' glee, their sin for which we then repent, with broken heart on bended knee. The healing hands cannot connect, and words cannot pass through the shell, of withered joy and crushed respect that bricks us up inside this hell. We pass along the bitter gall that tastes of shadows in the night, and bound are we to rise and fall in seeking out the morning's light. With time and luck, and patient yet, we may yet arise in molt of flame, to spread our wings and shed regret, and dare again to seek our name. A vile attar. For you who do not know what an attar is, it means a, a substance that is perfumed. Deceit is a vile attar. Avatars cut to the heel, sealing the cryptic stonework and words absurd and brittle. Spittle trails. The banshee wails and the sails are torn apart. A heart pulses equinox. Locks peaked with unsteady hands, demanding the ransom lost. Tossed aside in pride or rage, waging a war for its own sake, taking the waking to die. And I, I am still aware, faring better than I thought, what I have learned I will keep, sleeping on a sea of dreams, reams of the truth unpublished. I am better than I thought. There are two cycles in this volume. One is Amongst the Castled Rocks, and it's made up of seven fairly small pieces. The first one is The Wound. The wound feels not too deep, and yet it remains. It manifests in my sleep. It burns, and it stains. Drain me dry. Drain me dry, and I, I will regenerate the life you thought you'd sucked away. This is why, why I... I will always be listening for that phone call you promised me a lifetime ago. Get the feeling I was annoyed at somebody? The taste of your lips. I have forgotten the taste of your lips, for it has been long since autumn and winter laid hard the ice upon me. A veritable tomb in a frosted womb that there were those who swore I'd never rise from. Surprising, one and all, with the folly of my resurrection. None more than me, for I wanted only for the winds of a winter's night to take me. <laughs> yeah, I remember that. <laughs> a trick of the stone. There is a trick of passing, to passing through stone. You must tell every ounce of flesh and bone that there is no other way but through. Through to the other side as you slide back, then accelerate forward, finding new sounds in folded pressure waves, then new colors. And even light feels your vector and parts, skittish before the whim and will that drives you, without regret, into memory. Shelter in the cliffs. I will find shelter in the cliffs, the cliffs where once I watched you dance, naked in the rain I had called. Crawled from the skies and made rise the sun, I will find solace in the shadows, gray filters to harsh realities, I did not barter for when I made charter for your wishes to be granted, even to my own fall. Her way into my lair. And who will find her way into my lair? Who will dare to climb the mad rocks I cast to make both wall and staircase for the bravest souls? The ones that need most the air of this height, the night that holds nothing but promise and solace, the bondage of freedom, expressed without words. 
So I'll try something here. Legends painted in fading pigments. I would have told you all the things you wanted from me, the offerings of a sated, fated rapture captured for all the ages to marvel at. But you never asked me. You never asked me for that stone. Hard and perfect and beautiful, like the heart of a mishandled lover, cast aside in measure of the loss, glossing over the glossolalia where pillow puppets were our witness and we couldn't find the words again. I would have told you all the things you wanted from me, the offerings of a sated, fated rapture, captured for all the ages to marvel at. No Angel Calls I see you best in darkness, when the lights do not distract the distance, not impediment. I accept you as a fact, a memory yet to be fulfilled to the promise of the hours and the days, the years have broken bread enough. I have wandered foolish ways. The silence caught as melody and lies retract my fate. The banshees and the whispered wisp played herald to the wraith. Menagerie and mystery, lycanthropic philanthropies. Bloodied hands in silvered bands, shat shackles in jinn's dark disease. No angel calls, no comet falls, to light the night with omened kiss. Come for me, pale perfidy. We shall see if your arrows miss. Torn from the flesh. He spoke. He broke. And the pieces fell like leaves in an autumn shower, the power unplugged as the ground was hugged by the air seeking solace in the dirt. No more, he swore, still swore, still sore with the teething grief of splintered mysteries as the histories fell in place, like a puzzle of a stranger's face finally making sense of the hurt. The pain can't drain and thus the pressure builds beyond the predicted curve, where every nerve should rip and a keystone shall slip to let fall the palace to a rubble, inert. <laughs> Document of a slingshot trajectory for Icarus. We all know Icarus. Thought he could fly with wax wings made with feathers. Flew too high and uh, the wax melted into the ocean. Shadows rest not, but seek their will in corners where they can gain toeholds and spread cold seditions the better to unmake all good things. A time for all things to every purpose under heaven, including hell. Where the bells do not ring, they spit venom through crooked teeth and steal our belief to a place, in a place to rest where the shadows cannot find us, blind us, bind us to a fate invoking death. None but the phoenix. None but the phoenix shall ever get in. Thin skin splits for no tepid tyranny. I grew these walls and carried them from out of a city like a necessary evil, this exile. Every mile a test of legions learned. Icons burned into my living flesh. Shall I mesh this time with an illusion? I think not. Better still, the immolation of one dance begun and ended in unpretended fire. Light that cracks like heated glass at the touch of the god of ice. A vice to splice into my lineage? Palms to the wall, carrying the unanswered prayers to the sky, dying, prying away cold fingers like the remnant stingers of leopard wasps. Pain without death is a shallow breath that mocks the clock's tyranny. I want to see the fire before I die. Rise. Rise, dreaming from the ashes, envisioning futures cutting gashes from the ruddy walls of faded memory made a prison of the Amory, where once we lay playful lovers lost in the costless sins of passion. <coughs> Rise, gleaming from the ashes, quicksilver pouring from stored caches of 
life and beauty, a rainbow of grays playing on a wall of sacred sapphires, sprays of baby's breath and black roses chosen for their meaning, not their beauty. Rise, steaming from the ashes, a pinch of light and a saline flash emerging, merging into a purging potion of healing, sending you crashing and crested waves of feeling that you had peeled, congealed, sealed, and concealed like mulberry jam against an infinite winter's cold. <coughs> rise! Rise! Rise, damn you! Rise! Rise, screaming from the ashes, ascendant precedent for a flame tongue's lash to part skies and lies and thighs, and try as I might, I can see no further than this event horizon. Night as a beacon for the flight from photic silence, the violence of the cold stone of mortality. This is the cycle that is actually called Ronin in the temp Temple of Aphrodite. And it begins, remarkably enough, with the poem, A Ronin in the Temple of Aphrodite. A Ronin in the Temple of Aphrodite, armed with memory, to no avail. Pale to the sunset, waking with the dawn to find gone are the reasons behind the quick blade and dance of pain. Can you kiss with conscience? Can you kiss with conscience, knowing you are treading on holy ground, where the sounds of martyrs still echo in the shallow graves where masters and slaves met on equal terms, worms and sacrifices spread out on an altar to change themselves before it is too late? I see you in colors perfect. I see you in colors perfect, even though I know it is illusion and perfection is insurrection against the true nature of life. But whether you are lover or wife, sinner or saint, ashes or taint, <coughs> you are what I would see through half-closed eyes that catch every nuance that I might recall in the next world when I see you again. How ache my hands. How ache my hands to touch you, my arms to draw you near, to play champion to each challenge and to steal away each tear in sacrifice at endless price. Shall I unleash the dragon? Shall I unleash the dragon that waits in floating sphere for words of your new bidding, for news that you are near, and wish his resurrection to fly with eager wings on winds of your desire to drink from hidden springs? Feed fire to the phoenix. Feed fire to the phoenix, for that is what he craves, storing heat for when he'll meet his end in blazing waves. The final poem of the cycle, Ronan in the Temple of Aphrodite, Reprise. A Ronan in the Temple of Aphrodite hones his craft and with a laugh licks his wounds to fight another day. Subtext to a reflex to love is never wasted. Defeat is never tasted except a bite of bitter herbs, swallowed with regret, but motive to sweat and make sharper the edge, and watch for the sedge to wither from the lake, so that he can retreat inland and wait out the winter queens. When he seeks his spring in a woman's kiss and purpose for a life given more than once for an ungracious goddess. But with grace and no disgrace, he knows this space. He knows his place. Transubstantiation Part 3. I don't know whatever happened to Transubstantiation Parts 1 and 2. A complicated phase in a graying haze, alchemy in a flask that asked you, you asked to hold. Gold from base metals, love in the strangest places. Faces that melt and run in a sun that shades the moon, Soon is not enough, yesterday was missed. When we kissed the wind, sinned and thinned our sands that run between fingers rigid for time. Blocking fate, finding hate on a grate where heat pours, scores of opportunities left behind, blind to the kind chances we cannot rebuild as presents for a dance of decades, irrevocable. Grief is no relief for the true conscience.
Hold the Bridge. Hold the bridge while the world goes mad and the rabble scrabble like one-eyed dogs for the last bone, baying and praying to perversions of the Almighty, killing in the name of peace, cursing in the name of redemption. Hold the bridge with the poets and the minstrels and the ronin, who would rather die an honorable death than live a lie forced upon them by misguided honor. Lovers who love and dreamers who dream until the steam rises from their pyres at dawn. Hold the bridge. Just long enough to let those of courage of the second water, but fire nonetheless, burn and hack away the cords that ford hope and fall away to seal the base cowards of snide pride and fell principles. Hold the bridge. It is not enough to avoid evil, you must also resist it. With every breath in mortal form and shadow cast into the coming days to inspire those who seek legends and mythologies in the mystery of history, where there are those who dared to, who cared to, hold the bridge. <laughs> Backstab. This was written to a um, former lover who um, said some awful things after we broke up, and I'd given her permission to. Uh, I, I knew I was very popular with her friends and family, and I said, look, um, if you need to say anything bad about me in order to keep them on your side, do so. I'll survive. She did. <laughs> and I had some of them come to me and go, how could you have done that? I didn't do that. But she said you did. Mm. Said not against me proxies, Doxy. Of what are you afraid? Have I not your devils caught and all your dragons slayed? Do you fear as I draw near I might expect a kiss? Judge me not if you forgot the role I played in this. Have all your lies now taken form and seem to you now real? Are you mad to play me cad when I sheltered you in zeal? Send not against me proxies, Doxy. Of what are you afraid? Have I not your devils caught and all your dragons slayed? We are almost done. Three to go. This poem is called Strange But Beautiful. It was written to a uh, woman who I nicknamed the fairy. Um, the musical version of it is on one of my CDs. I don't remember which one. And uh, it came out pretty nice. Strange But Beautiful. The arc of the lark, a curve of unswerving passion fashioned in jasmine and honeysuckle wreaths to stop the Nosferatu's teeth from more than a taste, from laying waste to what in haste was imagined love, and some immortal dream of joy that mirrored what I'd seen in the sun's cleft, or so I imagined, in hope God had left. But it came from blood, not the ether that folds cold memory into the shrouds of distant stars, the better to bind noble scars, strange but beautiful. Strange but beautiful, I could sense your presence, but I cannot ken the vector of your approach. And like Hector, I cannot fight what I cannot touch in the light. Swinging blind against the walls as I kick against the pricks, I would place palms to cool stone walls and wait your arrival. Eyes shut to silence, the shadows of the fires, the shadow of desires that would blacken flesh and bone and drag me to the precipice to dance for the fates my amomancies. Strange but beautiful. This next poem, I wrote spontaneous, oh, practically all my poems I write spontaneously, but I wrote this poem spontaneously in a chat window on AOL while I was talking with my editor, Janet Innes. And she adores it, and I consider it a good statement of hope. It's called Glass Roses. Conceive of a flower, like no other, no color but the curving clarity, the photic charity of crystalline silence, past the rainbow's violence, a white fragrance, white as a virgin's first kiss, or the lost heartbeat I gave over to the universe when first we met. When first I set my sails for a new horizon, passion and pride put down and sacrificed, to the gods of love, to the 
holders of dreams to the bearers of my gift, to wings that take their lift from the winds of sorrow. A meadow of perfect blossoms, refracting the light you give me onto a page of history and hope. My brother, the night, takes me, and I am not tomorrow anymore, but my words endure, pure as a field of glass roses, row upon perfect chaotic row, not discovered in this incarnation, but they are out there. The final poem of the book. You made it. It's called Top Knot. My son really likes this poem. My son Elric. Dante doesn't really like my poems, but he's not a poetry person, and I understand that. I have dwelt too long in a place of subtle and stagnating, stagnating peace, knelt for too long, asking for the sand's release. This ronin is ready for the fields of battle again. It is where I am at peace with my nature. I am not a creature of reflection, but resurrection. Constantly burning away the layers of prayers to find the real soul beneath the tinfoil wrappers. Tears melt barren bones when we wept, when wept in purifying pain. A moment born of a purposed moment of truth. The fifth word rebuilds four corners on three wishes. The blade swishes in air apparent. And I step into the shadows. Thank you all very much. I know it's been an interesting week. I appreciate you coming to hear me. This will be posted to YouTube and also to a couple different locations on Facebook. Uh, once again, this is William F. DeVault, the Romantic Poet of the Internet and the U.S. National Beat Poet Laureate Emeritus, wishing you a good evening, a good week, a good year, and a good life. May you find love. And may it find you.